We talked about, uh, we've gone through the history of the shuttle a little bit. We're going to go into this more today. But to refresh your memory, there, there really were three subsystems on the shuttle that were pressing the state of the art. One was the thermal protection system, which we talked about, Tom Moser talked about. The other was the avionics system with the, with the computers, the uh, computer synchronized, the four computers uh, synchronized because, we, as we explained, the shuttle, really, you know, the orbiter really needs a computer to fly because it is a, a fly-by-wire system which is statically unstable. And the other system that was pressing the state of the art was the space shuttle main engine. It had a high pressure, high temperature, and high performance. And so you're going to hear about that today. Now the person that's going to talk to you, many of you I'm sure heard the term rocket scientist. But you probably don't really know what that means. Well today you're going to meet one. You're going to meet a true rocket scientist. Uh, J.R. Thompson was responsible for the design, development, test, and operation of the space shuttle main engine. During Apollo, JR had a very similar uh, function in the design and working on the uh, launch vehicle for the uh, Apollo vehicle. He became director of the Marshall Space Flight Center. Then he was deputy administrator of NASA in Washington. And now he's president of Orbital Sciences. You're in for a real treat, JR. <coughs> Thanks, Aaron. Uh, 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 Aaron asked me to, to consider this, uh, this uh, talk, uh, well, I don't know, several months ago, and I, <clears throat> I was a little hesitant at first, but then uh, the more I thought about it, uh, uh, it's given me a good opportunity to go back and, and uh, uh, you know, kind of recount some of, the, some of the highlights and the low points uh, in the program. It was, it was some 30 years ago. For me, so there's there's some of this that that's going to be still a little fuzzy, but there's a lot of it, a lot of it, that it's just like it was yesterday. <clears throat> uh, actually, the shuttle uh, the shuttle main engine has its roots back in the technology programs that were that were uh, uh, funded and came out of Apollo uh, as as early as the mid uh, 19. 60s. Uh, people at the Marshall Space Flight Center in the, in the same propulsion group that I was in, although my attention was focused on Apollo at that time, were uh, heavily involved with uh, Pratt Whitney, uh, Rocketdyne, and Aerojet in developing the uh, uh, high pressure turbo machinery that would one day be envisioned to use uh, in the shuttle if there ever were a shuttle. Uh, so that's back when it started, uh, uh, and there was a good bit of uh, effort put in at that time. Uh, um, I think, as you probably know, uh, uh, here Rocketdyne of North American uh, won the contract uh, in July, uh, actually July 13th of 1971. So shortly after Apollo, Apollo was still was still winding down when the shuttle program got, it, got its legs. Uh, and the shuttle main engine was one of the very early uh, 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 awards because as Aaron indicated, it was early on envisioned that that would be the, that would be the, uh, here what we call back then the long tent pole in the program. Uh, it uh, came on the heels of a one year uh, phase B competition uh, between uh, Pratt, uh, Rocketdyne, and Aerojet. Uh, during this Phase B, uh, NASA funded uh, uh, some, some technology demonstration, uh, requirements definition, uh, uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, actually, Rocketdyne at that time uh, did a very uh, bold, uh, demonstration of what they call powerhead, and I'll show you, I'll show you what that encompassed in just a minute. But it was a demonstration of the heart of the engine. It was only only operated for a short period of time, but very high pressure. It was uh, uh, it was risky. Uh, they pulled it off 
It was actually driven by a, a fellow called Paul uh, Kastenholt, who was the uh, 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 who was a guy coming out of Apollo that basically uh, solved or led the team that solved the combustion instability on the F-1 engine. So Paul was a very ambitious fellow, very aggressive, uh, very um, and very bold in trying to capture this award uh, for rocket dyne. At that time, though, NASA envisioned what they called a flyback booster. The shuttle main engine would be uh, was envisioned to be uh, 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 a common engine for the flyback booster, as well as the orbiter. Uh, in that early concept, there would be 12 SSMEs on the back end of the flyback booster, operating at uh, 550,000 pounds of vacuum uh, thrust, uh, and on the uh, orbiter. Uh, configuration, it was three engines operating at 632,000 uh, pounds of thrust and vacuum. Uh, because of the, of the uh, money that was forecasted at that time and that, that had been appropriated to date, NASA was always behind the, the power curve in the early phases of the program, and they never got uh, uh, everything they wanted, and I'm sure that uh, Dale Myers and others that have uh, preceded me have have told you the the ins and outs of of why then NASA scaled back from the flyback booster to the solid rocket motors, um, and so at that point the shuttle main engine uh, was refocused at uh, uh, 470,000 pounds of uh, uh, thrust and. And that was at what's called the rated power level. Uh, at that time, I think there was a full power level uh, and an emergency power level of 109% of, of the rated thrust that was in the program. But I'll show you a view graph in a minute that has the uh, specific parameters of the, of the engine as it finally settled out. Um, uh, uh, after the award, uh, Pratt Whitney protested. Uh, it was, uh, uh, you know, it was a hard-fought uh, uh, competition. Uh, NASA had specified a, uh, a uh, uh, that they wanted an engine bell configuration, a nozzle bell, as opposed to Rocketdyne's uh, aerodynamic uh, spike that they had promoted uh, in the late uh, '60s. Uh, and uh, knows what an aerospike is. You might say one or two things about that. Well, it's a it's a truncated uh, uh, nozzle. It doesn't have uh, uh, actually. It's packaged uh, and and uh, and derives the nozzle from uh, from the uh, uh, from the expansion of the gases that are that uh, 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 here where the nozzle wall is formed by, uh, by additional gases that come out in the coolant system. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a very high performance, uh, a performing engine. It's, uh, 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 its packaging is uh, uh, certainly an advantage where you don't need a, a big boat tail. Uh, say like you would with the engine, so you're you're saving about 10 or 12 feet there, and the weight that goes along with that. Uh, Pratt Whitney uh, 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 had been uh, focusing on the, on the bell nozzle all the time, and frankly, uh, those of us that were uh, kind of on the periphery of this program and and still involved in the Apollo. Uh, Kind of figured that Pratt had uh, had the uh, advantage in this because uh, Rocketdyne was, of course, awarded the propulsion systems for the Apollo Saturn uh, program, and uh, you know it was kind of viewed as as uh, as Pratt Whitney's uh, uh, turn. Uh, it didn't turn out that way. It was uh, I attribute a lot of that to the to the uh, uh, to the good proposal, the boldness. And the 
in the uh, in the demonstration program that, that Pratt Whitney or the Rocketdyne accomplished during the during the uh, during the competitive uh, uh, period. Uh, but anyway, Pratt Whitney uh, uh, protested. It took about nine months for the protest to be uh, settled. It was uh, settled in favor of uh, of Rocketdyne. Uh, 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 in the meantime, Rocketdyne was allowed to continue to com to uh, uh, to work with uh, uh, the contractors on the vehicle side because they hadn't made the selection at that time there, uh, uh, so they could continue to support their work. Uh, but anyway, in 19. Uh, uh, 72, it was all settled. A uh, contract was uh, awarded, uh, uh, cost plus, uh, and as I recall, it was um, 200 million for the development, which was called Phase A, and 200 million for the production, which was called Phase B. And uh, the Phase B program included, I believe, 26 uh, production engines. Uh, I won't comment as to what the cost eventually grew to, but uh, very substantially uh, beyond that. Let me kind of kind of highlight for you the the characteristics of the of the uh, uh, of the engine. I think I mentioned the thrust levels. The uh, uh, the rated power level uh, was 470,000 pounds. Uh, it had the capability, uh, if an engine was out early and you wanted to abort to orbit, uh, to throttle the engine up to 109% to, uh, to of the rated thrust, that was called uh, full power level. Early on in the program, I think it was termed uh, emergency power level. But uh, 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 at the rated conditions, uh, it accommodated... Uh, 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 or required a little over 3,000 pounds per square inch chamber pressure in the combustion chamber. Uh, the area ratio of the nozzle uh, was uh, uh, 77 to 1. It had a very good specific impulse, about 453, 454. Uh, that compares to uh, J2 and... Uh, uh, in Apollo of about 442, as I recall, somewhere in that range. Uh, weight was uh, about 7,000 pounds. Uh, life, uh, seven and a half hours in 55 mission. Uh, that's quite misleading, though, let me tell you. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll comment more uh, uh, on this as we go through. Um, but it was a very... Uh, uh, it was a tough development program. Uh, it took from uh, uh, 72, as I mentioned, through first flight in 1981. Uh, I joined the program uh, uh, after Apollo and after Skylab in May of 1974. Uh, and it was uh, torture from there until uh, the first flight in April of uh, 81. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Early on, it was envisioned that the, uh, that the uh, uh, as I mentioned, the SSME would be used for both the flyback booster and the orbiter configuration. Uh, it, would, it would use basically the same power head. Uh, you would just change out the nozzles to give you the two uh, engine thrust levels. Uh, and so it was, it was rather simple in that concept. Of course, that's not the way it worked out. It went to one configuration on the, uh, uh, to service the orbiter. And so everything was optimized and, uh, and focused on that. Uh, <clears throat> now let me say a few words about uh, the, uh, uh, the schematic itself and what the, what the, uh, uh, what the engine looked like in uh, in conceptual terms, it had a it had two low pressure pumps, which were to required to uh, give the proper uh, inlet pressures to both high pressure pumps to avoid uh, cavitation. Uh, it had the two uh, high pressure pumps uh, 
that was all fed through a common power head uh, to a thrust chamber uh, uh, assembly and then into the nozzle. The, uh, 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 here, starting on the fuel side, the, uh, the fuel uh, uh, pump uh, uh, increased the pressure to about uh, 300 pounds per square inch. Uh, and then that went into the uh, to the high pressure pump on the fuel side, where the pressure was boosted to a little over 6,000 pounds per square inch. About 80 percent of the fuel uh, all went to the two preburners, the fuel and the oxidizer preburner, uh, contrasted to about uh, 12 percent of the oxidizer. Uh, that was to uh, to provide a very fuel rich. Uh, 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 power system to drive the two turbines, the fuel, high pressure fuel pump turbine and the LOX pump turbine. Uh, the turbine temperatures were uh, in the range of uh, 1750 degrees uh, 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 here, Rankin. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, after X. Uh, almost all of the all of the housing structure uh, on the uh, uh, probably 80 percent of the engine was in canal. Uh, very tough uh, steel. Uh, be able to take very high pressures. Uh, as I mentioned, the uh, uh, the combustion pressure uh, in the chamber was about 3,000 pounds per square inch. Uh, at the entry to the preburner, uh, the the pressure could get up to 8,000 pounds per square inch. So it was uh, it was a very high pressure system up and down. It was all in series. In other words, there was no, and this 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 was the way they achieved the high efficiency. All of the all of the propellant uh, came through the low pressure system, the high pressure system, into the preburners, into through the cooling circuits all in the hot gas manifold, all in the main chamber, all of it exited in the, uh, the nozzle. None was dumped overboard uh, to simplify the, uh, uh, the flow path. Um, uh, that part, uh, uh, a good bit of the, of the fuel at the exit of the, of the high pressure pump went directly to feed the two preburners. Uh, a good bit of it, about 20% of it, went to cool the, the nozzle uh, then up and uh, up through and cool the uh, the uh, uh, here rather drove the the uh, uh, the turbine because it was uh, it was uh, 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 here having cooled the nozzle it was converted to a, a warm gas which was then driven uh, then drove the low pressure turbine came back in and was captured and and uh, served to cool the uh, uh, the shell of the hot gas manifold. Same similar thing on the uh, on the uh, uh, oxidizer side. By the way, I'll mention the speeds of the of the low pressure fuel pump was about 15,000 RPM. High pressure fuel pump about 35,000 RPM. Uh, the speed of the low pressure LOX pump was 5,000 RPM, and of the high pressure oxidizer pump about 30,000 RPM. Uh, the discharge of the low pressure LOX pump was about uh, 250 pounds per square inch. Uh, entered into a uh, uh, to the main LOX pump, where the pressure was elevated to 4,500 pounds per square inch. Uh, uh, then it went to the uh, uh, some to the preburners and the rest directly into the into the uh, into the main combustion chamber. Some part of the uh, of the uh, of the LOX flow then was uh, was further boosted to about uh, a little over 8,000 pounds per square inch, which fed the oxidizer into the two preburners. So it was a very efficient cycle, very high pressure cycle. Uh, a couple other features that you don't see on this chart: uh, there was a heat exchanger wrapped around the uh, uh, the high pressure oxidizer turbo pump turbine. Uh, which uh, served to preheat uh, 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 gas to pressurize the uh, 
the oxidizer uh, uh, tank. Uh, I think those are the major points that I would make on the uh, on the cycle itself. Uh, uh, most of the problems I'll just point out here had very few problems with the uh, two low pressure pumps. Uh, uh, a lot of technology. Uh, in the high pressure pumps, both fuel and oxidizing. The main uh, uh, problem with the high pressure fuel pump was uh, subsynchronous, uh, subsynchronous uh, whirl, and I'll, I'll I'll say a little bit more about this in a moment. It was a very traumatic time in the early uh, uh, period of developing the shuttle main engine. Uh, caused a lot of delays, tough problem to solve, and I'll mention uh, what caused it and how we solved it. Then the high pressure uh, oxidizer turbo pump uh, 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 bearing overloads, uh, uh, locks fires, explosions. Uh, that was the, probably the single uh, toughest uh, uh, component to, uh, to develop in the program, as I recall it. Uh, 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 I think those are, the, those are the major points that I'll that I'll make there. Uh, early on, it was uh, it was planned uh, because they had such a head start in uh, in uh, 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 in in planning for the development of this program, and uh, it, it was uh, it was uh, uh, planned to be done in a very uh, methodical way. Uh, and they had a very elaborate, um, when I say they, I'm talking about the, the people at Marshall with the people at, uh, at Rocketdyne, a very elaborate system of design verification system where you uh, uh, couldn't progress to the next stage until you had passed certain testing on a, on a valve or on a low pressure pump. And all this was envisioned to be done up at Santa Susana which is uh, uh, here right out uh, uh, a short distance from Canoga Park up in the mountains on some test facilities that both uh, NASA and Rocketdyne uh, owned up at that time and that they were carried over from the, uh, uh, carried over and upgraded from the Apollo program uh, to be done on, uh, on the component facilities up there. But because of the high pressures involved, it became a very expensive uh, undertaking, uh, a very um, uh, a lot of money, uh, too much time, huge facilities, uh, 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 valves that were uh, probably as big as uh, that sidewall over here uh, to be able to handle these high pressures to. Uh, to assist in the development of this high-pressure turbo machinery. So I think it, it, it became pretty clear pretty early in the program that that very methodical way of developing the engine, and that is let's, you know, before we go to an engine system test, let's develop it at the component level. So we, so we eliminate those problems, uh, although theoretically sounded very good. Uh, it just didn't work. The, 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 the facilities were not available uh, in time to do that. Uh, uh, and the money was going to be uh, 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 exorbitant. Uh, uh, kind of a side story, there was a, there was a contractor, uh, Bovey Crail, as I recall, was the name of the contractor out in Los Angeles. And uh, uh, early in the program, uh, when they were they were having uh, uh, contract discussions, and uh, Bovey Crail was laid, and Rocketdyne, uh, at the insistence of NASA, was withholding money until they made certain progress, and and so this fellow who was the president of uh, of um, uh, of Rocketdyne, Bill Brennan, I was spending a lot of time out there, and. He invited me to sit in this meeting that uh, he was going to have with the head of Bovey Crail, uh, 
Uh, I guess he thought maybe it would impress him that uh, somebody from NASA was watching this thing. And anyway, so I joined him. I think it was a Saturday morning, and and uh, uh, both Bill and I had on uh, suits and coat and ties, and, and this uh, uh, contractor from uh, uh, head guy from Bovey Creel, he came in with some white bucks. He had on some yellow pants and a pink shirt. And uh, he, he plopped down on, uh, on Bill's uh, sofa there, and before Bill could, uh, could open his mouth, uh, he, he said, uh, all I want is my blankety-blank money. And so it was a, it was a short discussion. <laughs> uh, he, was, uh, uh, he was there to collect his money, and, uh, and, uh, and Brennan couldn't, uh, couldn't pay him because of, con of the, some of the restrictions that NASA had. So, so it was a... It was a it was a messy deal trying to get those facilities built and and it uh, it became clear that we were going to have to do them have to develop the components in parallel with the engine test. It was a, it was the biggest systems engineering challenge that I think we had in the shuttle program. Uh, uh, certainly, there were a lot of challenges in in major systems integrating the. The, uh, sh uh, the shuttle engine into the orbiter, for example, but, but down at the engine level, the systems engineering, to develop those components, the two low pressure pumps, the two high pressure pumps, the pre-burners, the, the hot gas manifold, the main injector, uh, all the control valves, uh, and then we also had on the engine, which I didn't show on the schematic, uh, a computer. Uh, redundant computers that were cross-strapped so that uh, the input or the output could be uh, could be cross-strapped and be very uh, 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 tolerant to failure. Uh, uh, so we went to what we called an integrated subsystem test bed, ISTB. That became the, 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 uh, the bobtail engine of the program. Bobtail, it was a 35 and a half, uh, 35 to 1 area ratio nozzle, which it allows us to, uh, to not only start the engine, but to uh, uh, operate it at the throttle condition, 50% of the rated thrust, and the, nozzle, and the nozzle would still flow full. It would not separate. And so then we could proceed with the development of the testing, or the development of the engine uh, uh, program. It was a very... Uh, 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 it was an efficient way to go about the program so we didn't stall. It was tough because we had to solve the engine problems in parallel with the component problems all at the same time. And sometimes it was hard to tell which was the problem. Uh, we started our uh, first test in May of 1975. Uh, the people, I'm... Uh, that's me there on the left, and Norm Rule, uh, who replaced Paul Kastenholz, and uh, uh, there in the center, and Dom Sankini, who I view to this day as the strength <coughs> of the shuttle program, who, uh, uh, or rather the main engine, who uh, eventually replaced uh, Norm. Uh, a few, a few comments on the evolution of the, of some of the people on. Uh, on the contractor side, I mentioned uh, Paul Kastenholz, who to me was uh, the key to Rocketdyne winning the, uh, of the program. At that time, it was, you know, this is a personal view. I think, I think Rocketdyne took a big sigh of relief after they won the contract. Probably relaxed a little too long, got in trouble uh, uh, up at Santa Susana in not developing that, uh, that component facility. Uh, the, the, uh, the test uh, control centers up there uh, uh, were Coke bottles were laying around. So it was not a, uh, a well-disciplined uh, operation. They had gotten uh, uh, lax, I guess was the best uh, way to say it. Norm Rule came in uh, to... Uh, uh, to run the program at the request of NASA. He was, uh, uh, had done the same job on the J-2 and other uh, 
programs within uh, within Rocketdyne for the uh, uh, Saturn program, uh, uh, and uh, work with uh, uh, me and and the other fellows at uh, Marshall, and we appointed Dom to uh, to drive this ISTB uh, uh, to help us learn how to start the engine, to how we could uh, properly integrate a number of the components. Uh, into the engine, and proved in the long run to be a to be a a, a very valuable uh, tool. Uh, this uh, chart depicts the uh, the buildup of uh, of, uh, of runtime on the engine. Test seconds are plotted on the, on the right in thousands, and uh, and the number of tests plotted on the left in the year. Uh, as shown down here, we started, as I mentioned, in, in 1975. We fly, finally threw, uh, flew in April of 1981 on uh, uh, STS-1. Uh, uh, the title, uh, someone asked me a little earlier, that's First Manned Orbital Flight. Uh, that's what we referred to, the, to, the, uh, uh, to our goal back at that time. I've highlighted along the way some, I believe there are 14 major engine explosions, uh, all of which were very traumatic in, in themselves. I'll show you some pictures uh, shortly of what, of, what, uh, of what an engine looks like after it goes through that, and then you can extrapolate that to envision what was uh, in the boat tail of the orbiter had it occurred in flight and what, would it, what, what it would have done to the flight itself. Uh, the, uh, uh, the test seconds curve is down here. You can see the, the long plateau of about nine months, uh, where a combination of, of learning to uh, properly ignite the engine without overtemping the uh, turbine blades or the turbine, you know, other parts of the turbine, uh, combined with what I'll call this subsynchronous whirl. Uh, on the uh, high pressure uh, uh, fuel pump. Subsynchronous whirl, uh, there's a, a, a very exotic uh, definition of it, but, but it's an orbiting, an orbiting of the shaft within the bearings themselves uh, caused by the, a softening of that system. And you can imagine the softening is attributed to uh, overheating of the bearings. You don't have the stiffness. And so this allows the rotor to uh, orbit uh, there. Vibrations get very uh, high, uh, and, uh, 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 and we have to shut the engine down. Uh, we couldn't, couldn't get into the test, but about 2.35 seconds was the nominal time uh, before we would encounter this very high vibration and then have to shut the uh, shut the uh, uh, engine down. Uh, and, then, and then after that, the, the, the engine and the turbo machinery was located down at Mississippi where we were doing the testing. The, uh, you'd have to, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, it wasn't like you could just try it again. You had to bring it all back, replace the bearings, try to figure out what the problem was, put in some kind of a fix. We went through a number of fixes, trying to stiffen the system uh, so we could uh, be able to tolerate the uh, uh, and drive through. The, our thought at that time was that if we could ever get through this period, then we would be all right. Um, but as it turned out, pardon. Well, it manifests itself in uh, uh, overheating of the bearings, uh, spalling uh, 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 of the bearings in their raceways. And so basically, uh, uh, you know, once we, you know, after you, uh, 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 I think turbine speeds at that time or the, or the, or the speed of the rotor was probably in the 15,000 RPM. Uh, before you could catch the engine and shut it down, uh, operating for a second or a half a second uh, with those high side loads, inadequate cooling, overheating of the bearings, 
uh, you'd get the bearings back and you'd put them in your hand, and they were they were uh, uh, very much damaged. I mean, that was the that was the manifestation of the problem. The uh, 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 so we went into this for for quite a quite a period of time. I think what I wanted to capture was the was the picture over here. Ignore this. This is more dramatic. I'll come back to that later. But this is the uh, this is the high uh, uh, the high pressure fuel turbo pump. The uh, subsynchronous whirl uh, 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 and the overheating of the bearings occurred on the turbine side. Uh, the the coolant path is probably going to be hard for you to see. But you come through some labyrinth seals here, go down this passage, up through the center of the shaft, and in through the through the uh, uh, through some provisions that were made to cool the bearings on a turbine on a turbine end. Um, we brought in a lot of external uh, consultants, uh, had a lot of cooperation from uh, from people across the country. Uh, but a after nine months, it was it was one of the internal guys at Rocketdyne, Joe Stanglin, who uh, uh, and some of the people in his turbo machinery group that came up with the idea that there was a vortex that was occurring in this cavity on the on the on a turbine end, and and uh, uh, and what we had to do was to kill that vortex, and then allow the coolant to go through, and so he. He, uh, uh, he put a little of what he called a paddle, which is this part you see right here. It's about the size of a dime. It was screwed in to the, to the, uh, 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 here to the rotor at that point. And uh, first test, that we, uh, after we included the paddle right off the block, uh, where the engine had been stalled at, uh, uh, and couldn't get beyond about 2.35 seconds, Went right up to uh, to the minimum power level, which is the uh, which is the power level we had set and, and planned planned all of the tests to accelerate to that level, if if it could uh, you know if we could make it, and so it was a very dramatic uh, 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 solution fixed and allowed the program to uh, uh, to move on and see what was behind the next uh, you know the next uh, hurdle we were gonna. Uh, run into so this problem number one was just being able to uh, understand and accommodate the start sequence. Uh, you had to start the uh, engine fuel rich. Uh, uh, any excessive oxidizer would uh, 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 give you a cutoff because of all the all the sensors that we had. The second problem and the one that that caused us the most time. That I've mentioned is the high, is the uh, high pressure fuel turbo pump uh, subsynchronous whirl, and then problem number three, which are duplicated here several times, is the uh, 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 are the locks pump explosions. Uh, they could be uh, 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 triggered by uh, uh, loss of a turbine blade. Uh, on the turbine end, which would unbalance the rotor, overload the bearings, uh, uh, and then cause a, uh, uh, a locks rich uh, fire, which very quickly uh, uh, consumed the whole engine. Uh, there were a numerous, uh, well, three or I think three, three, uh, rather four highlighted there. Uh, we had some other uh, problems. Uh, I. I've noted a, a, a fuel preburner burn through, just a structural burn through of the, At the fuel preburner. Yes. Yeah. How did you eventually solve that? Because the last failure you had was also um, the liquid oxygen from the explosion. So. Well, we. Um, um, I'm not sure I can differentiate between the. Uh, between the locks pump explosions, but the uh, uh, late in the program, probably at that time, we uh, 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 had been having for a long time uh, 
uh, problems with the turbine blades, very limited life. Uh, cracks would grow. Uh, at that time, we didn't really understand uh, what a, uh, you know, how long we could run them before we had to replace them. Uh, so we went to dampers uh, on the turbine blades. Uh, and this occurred fairly late in the program that, that eventually uh, solved the, uh, uh, the, uh, the vibration of the, of the blades within the, within the, uh, of the turbine wheel stack and, uh, uh, and allowed us to proceed. Whether that was that one that caused the imbalance of the rotor or, or some earlier when they were uh, pr primarily driven by uh, bearing problems, uh, considered for some time, we used ball bearings in the, uh, in the Rocketdyne turbo machinery. Uh, later in the program, they've gone to uh, roller bearings. Uh, Pratt Whitney has, uh, has been contracted to develop that. Uh, but uh, the bearing problems and turbine blades were the, were the major uh, uh, problems, as I recall, that, that caused the LOX pump uh, problems. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was thinking, I've got yes. Do you think uh, you would have had similar problems uh, if you developed an aerospike instead of uh, instead of? No, uh, the um, you know the turbo machinery was going to have to be basically the same, uh, and so no, I think the problems would. Uh, no, you'd have the same problems. Uh, the the, uh, the only problems that we had on the, on the engine that were uh, uh, caused by the uh, 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 we had a nozzle steer horn failure. That was just a it was a, uh, a structural feed line that was in the shape of a steer horn at the aft end of the of the bell nozzle. Uh, we had two of those uh, uh, structural failures. Uh, that were very traumatic for the program. One prior to, uh, uh, no, they were both right here. Um, um, and of course, as soon as you, as soon as you lose uh, uh, that, the coolant to the nozzle, uh, you start shutting down a lot of the, of the uh, uh, engine system locks rich, which causes a fire. Uh, so certainly you would have eliminated those. You would have el eliminated a number of, uh, of, uh, of, I'll call them nuisance problems in terms of, of uh, 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 we had 1,080 tubes uh, that, that made up the nozzle that we flowed the hydrogen through to keep the nozzle cool, 1,080 of them. And we had a number of, of again, I would call them nuisance cracks or splits in those uh, tubes that we learned to live with we learned to go out and put a cap on them, post-flight, braze over, and just uh, uh, cap off the leak. Uh, uh, so certainly you wouldn't have had those. But uh, all of the other problems I would have seen common between the aerospike as well as, a, as, the, uh, as the bell nozzle. Um, In the shuttle main engine, had the pressures that you mentioned, 3,000 feet pounds per square inch up to 8,000. Give us some feeling for just how much higher that was than the previous operational engines, and whether the pressure itself was causing a lot of these problems. Oh, yes. Uh, the, the, uh, the J2 uh, w would be uh, uh, chamber pressure was about uh, 700 pounds per square inch, as I recall it. RL10. Uh, which was the first LOX hydrogen engine in the country, developed by Pratt Whitney. Uh, uh, chamber pressure was uh, uh, a couple hundred pounds per square inch. So, so uh, this was a real uh, push. Uh, 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 was it worth it? Uh, you know, as you look back on the engine, uh, uh, you've now taken to orbit uh, over over 300. Of these engines in a hundred flight, three at a time, uh, you've had one shut down because of a sensor, a safety sensor that failed, that that uh, shut one engine down in flight, 
and we were far enough along in the flight so that we aborted to orbit. On the other two, burned a little longer and went to orbit. Um, uh, but it was a it was a very costly program. I, I uh, on some reflection, I, I I'm not sure that that driving the tech, you know, it was almost it was almost view, you know it was almost viewed in the in the late '60s is that's the challenge, not the shuttle engine, but the technology. I mean, let's let's really drive the technology, make it very efficient, uh, very high pressure. Uh, 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 it, 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 Aaron and I were talking a little earlier. That's the, the engine people. You know, had the orbiter flown a hundred times, you'd have you know, and had several major failures. People would have expected the shuttle engine, I think, to have have been the cause. That's not the way it turned out. And I'll I'll comment on at least a contributor uh, uh, in just a minute. Uh, the uh, um, but just first on the on the. Uh, 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 you know, this is the aftermath of um, you know when you're in a uh, in the middle of a of a development program, you you've got uh, you know you've got a lot of budget pressures. You've got uh, uh, the shuttle first flight date was was changed several times. Uh, you got all that hanging over your head. Uh, and then you're called down or, or down at Mississippi and on a test stand and you look and you look down on the engine and that's what it looks like. It's a, you know, it's a, it's like a kick in the, in the stomach. You got to start all over. Well, that was, that occurred, you know, that picture, that mental picture was, was in our minds 14 times in this program where you had to start over. The recovery was, uh, you know, typically it took about a month. Uh, we we formed a, a team, usually within Rocketdyne and one within NASA, uh, to 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 go uh, solve the problem. Uh, probably half of the time, it was fairly evident what the problem was quickly after the test. Uh, sometimes it took a couple of weeks. To narrow it down to a, it could have been this or that, and then you fix both this or that, uh, uh, not knowing exactly what it was. Um, and so it was a very uh, 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 tedious, time-consuming. Uh, uh, we were testing around the clock. If it occurred at, during the holidays, you just canceled your holidays and and jumped in, and you know we did what we had to do. Uh, you know, I'll mention as I look back, one of the one of the kind of the dumbest things that I did on this program was somewhat associated with uh, with the testing. Uh, this happened to be, uh, I think, back uh, early on in the in the subsequentist world days, we were uh, changing out the turbo machinery after uh, almost every test because we were we were doing the damage to the bearings that I described a little earlier. And it took about uh, three shifts to change out a, uh, a turbo pump down in Mississippi. And, uh, you know, that was, you know, and then it took flight time to get the, uh, the turbo pump back to L.A. and then tear it down. But we had others in the meantime that we were bringing along. But it was, it was very time consuming. And, and it was in the middle of the summer uh, back in, you know, whenever it was, 75 or when. Ever and uh, uh, a lot of rain showers, and and that was holding us up because you couldn't, you know, when it was raining or it looked like it was going to rain, you couldn't open up the engine, drop the pump, and 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 take it back. So that slowed us down. And so I had a brilliant idea of of uh, uh, here. First of all, the engine. If any of you ever been down to Mississippi on those test stands, it's on about the fifth level. Is the engine position about the fifth level? And so on about the seventh level, I wanted to put a, a, a here what I call a rain shield uh, to put a, a, a tin roof uh, 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 a couple of, uh, of levels higher than the engine so the, so the workers wouldn't have, to, wouldn't have to stop when it was raining. Well, you can probably imagine what happened. Um, that was okay for a while. And then we were back into a test. 
and we had a hydrogen leak and we did not uh, uh, we weren't using the igniters at that time at the end of the bell uh, uh, to, bur uh, to burn off a leak. So that leak just accumulated on those two uh, stories up to that uh, rain shield. And then when we went into the test and lit the engine off, the whole Mississippi sky, it, it was, you know, there wasn't any, you know, fuel. It was, uh, uh, you know, burned all the wires, didn't, didn't damage the end canal on the, on the engine structure. So that was, uh, uh, I certainly got a lot of ribbon after that, but it was, uh, 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 it was, uh, it w and as I, I recall, it was, uh, uh, the test was in toward the evening. I wasn't down there at the time to see it, but, uh, but was listening to the test over the, over the phone, and, uh, uh, and, and, the, and the guys almost couldn't speak. I mean, the whole, the whole place went up. So it was, uh, uh, these kind of failures, this was not a, you know, this was not a, 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 a evidence of a little fuel fire. This was oxidizer, oxidizer, and the fuel was the metal. And so it was, uh, 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 you know, quite a problem for us. The, uh, uh, <clears throat> I might mention at this time that just this last summer, uh, I attended a little, uh, a little event there in uh, Huntsville, where the where, where the Rocketdyne team came down, and now the the engine program had just passed its millionth uh, test second mark, and so you can see uh, uh, for STS one the total sec test seconds were about 110,000. <coughs> a little over half of that, 65,000, almost 70,000. At the rated or at the at the rated conditions, the the conditions you flew it at, and so it's gone up by about a factor of uh, of ten in the meantime. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, another key to the to the shuttle uh, 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 engine program was uh, was the. Uh, the philosophy imparted by John Yardley to, uh, 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 I think he recognized early on that, uh, that the engine, the, you know, we'd bitten off probably a little bit more than we could chew to have a, uh, uh, an engine that you could solve the problems of, of where you put the bearings in there, you ran them for you know, the earlier view graph I had said 55 starts. You ran them for five starts, and they came out in pristine condition. That wasn't going to happen. And the, and the turbine blades, uh, one blade failure. I actually forget how many are in those two two stages on that wheel. Uh, probably well over a hundred, but but one would would off offset or offload. Uh, the balance on that rotor, so then you would overload the bearings going at the high speed of the 35,000 RPM and, uh, and would fail it. So the, so the turbine blades were, were uh, you know, you just could not tolerate a failure. Uh, but, but in evidence after testing where you'd tear the blades down and, and, and destack them and, and look at them under a microscope, you could see cracks, fatigue cracks. And so uh, uh, all of us, I think, but John, John provided the leadership, uh, you know, recognize this fact. And, that, and, if, and if, if the requirement were going to be that, that you wouldn't fly with turbine blade cracks, we weren't going to fly. Um, and so he encouraged us in, in that uh, instance, in, in bearings, and in probably other areas to to, to test a failure, uh, drive it to failure, know where the you know know where the cliff was, and then and then back off a sufficient amount, and then and then conduct your certification uh, 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 with crack blades, with spall bearings, so that it was clear to everybody that that uh, you know it was clear to the people that were running the program that were. <coughs> 
that that then had to uh, and others that had to fly that uh, that the problem was was understood we thought reasonably well understood and it was uh, uh, tested to accommodate that condition um, and so that was a philosophy that was ingrained uh, uh, in the shuttle uh, and uh, uh, and probably not enough in in some of the other areas. The, you know, the shuttle, the shuttle engine program was uh, was a little bit blessed with this uh, this uh, uh, fear of uh, failure. It's the toughest technical problem, so we got the most money. I mean, there's a, you know, it's it's not all a downside. So so we got the money to provide the test depth. That uh, provided the the insight to the to the shuttle managers that uh, that could make the, the the call as to when we were ready to go. Um, you know the squeaky wheel gets oil. Uh, I contrast that with uh, you know maybe the famous uh, O-ring uh, on the booster. That that was a uh, a problem that was kind of observed. A uh, few tests were run, but but not enough to uh, uh, you know not to failure. It 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 wasn't tested to ever tested to failure on the ground. It was tested so you could see that the O-rings were split, uh, maybe, but not to see you know to have to be staring at a picture like that as to as to what's going to happen when that O-ring gives and 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 very quickly can burn through. Uh, and I could, uh, you know, the other example I would make is a, is a tank. And, and this is the most frustrating to me because uh, uh, early on we all saw some of that foam come off. But but not in the size pieces that, that the shuttle program saw three flights before Columbia. I mean, that was a, that was a size, that was a, piece of foam about this size. It came straight down the vehicle. It made a small dent in the aft skirt of the solid rocket boosters that were subsequently recovered. But that should have been a that should have been a an eye opener that that that, that piece of foam doesn't always have to go straight down the uh, the side of that vehicle. It could it could it could get out in the slipstream and and hit a wing or something. Um, so that type of testing was was never done. It, it was never uh, 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 it was never done. Whereas on the engine program, I mean, the, the you know there were a number of flaws that that uh, uh, that were uh, accommodated and we and we felt comfortable with. Now you go and read the read the Challenger report. You read the Columbia report. And and they will almost tell you that that NASA became comfortable with uh, 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 flaws, and that that led to the problem. But that was, you know, I take issue with that. I, I'm I I viewed it different because that was that was almost the foundation of the shuttle engine program. It was built on flaws. It was it was built. It, it, it was it was tested, so you knew where every uh, wherever the soft spots were, uh, you knew it and you and you attacked it and and, and tested in the appropriate way. Uh, the uh, you know John Yardley, I keep coming back to him. He he uh, as a part of the certification programs of which. I think prior to the first uh, uh, orbiter flight, there were eight certifications completed. One of those certifications was to be conducted, and a certification, as I recall, was about 13 tests. All it did. One was a uh, abort to orbit, which was a uh, 623 seconds and uh, a nominal uh, uh, shuttle test or, or mission 520 seconds, I think. And then a, an RTLS, return to launch site, is 820-something seconds. So, so it had a mix of those in there. So the engine, it had some FPL, 
uh, full power level. Uh, so it was tested at all of the limits. But, but in some of those certifications, we had to go into the test with cracked turbine blades. We started the test with a known crack. Uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, we knew or we knew by analysis what its growth rate was that we had judged from other tests. And so we, uh, you know, we planted blades that did that. We did the same thing with berries. Uh, what, <laughs> you know, one time to, you know, where both Dom Sankini and I were, you know, trying to, trying to get the most in every test. So we, we put cracked blades and, and, and small balls and, you know, combined them all in a test. Now, Yardy didn't, didn't mean that. You know, he, he didn't want to go that far. But uh, 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 there, was a lot of, there was a lot of NASA leadership that, that, uh, that bucked up the back of the program managers, uh, both myself and Sankini. I mean, they, they knew the way, to, the way to develop the confidence in this engine was to, was to test it, and that became, that became the theme. That isn't true today. Uh, it's a, you know, and that's what I worry about, and I, I, can, I can come back and, and, uh, uh, and comment uh, a little bit more on that in a minute. Uh, uh, I will say, a few more words about uh, Dom Sankini. <clears throat> he was uh, 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 he passed away about 15 years ago, uh, probably in his early 60s. Uh, was the deputy program manager on the F1 engine uh, to uh, 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 Paul Kastenhoff. Uh, uh a good engineer. He was a lawyer by trade, but he had also accumulated uh, a good background, well steeped in engineering. Uh, he, uh, a hard driver, uh, he, he, uh, he thrived on failures uh, because he saw a failure as, that's when you're on the steepest part of the learning curve. You never learn more than, than, than in the aftermath of a failure where you're forced to go through and look at all of the data and, and postulate uh, uh, you know, a lot of other different failure modes. So he, he almost, uh, well, he thrived on it. I mean, that was, uh, uh, you know, and he, he, uh, he made sure that the whole Rocketdyne team viewed it, viewed it in that light. Uh, so he was a real strength, uh, uh, a real strength to the program. Um, uh, I want to allow a little bit of time for, uh, 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 some discussion a few minutes ago, I alluded to the fact, but that's that's not the case now. The 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 shuttle engine uh, is uh, you know back back in the in the heyday uh, or the time period when we were in the development program, we were uh, uh, building them around the clock out of Canoga Park, uh, three shifts in the you know out on the manufacturing floor. Uh, <clears throat> probably at a rate of about about one a month, uh, ten ten a year. Yeah, that's that's about right. Uh, so high, you know, pretty high production rate. They were pretty, you know, the the uh, uh, I could probably ask for a show of hands. You know how much a shuttle engine cost? You know, just to make one. You, you got the foggiest idea. My last count was about forty million. I imagine in today's money, it's probably closer to sixty. Sixty million a copy. Um, but today they build about three quarters of an engine a year. So the production rate is 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 way down. They 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 test, you know, ex you know, aside from a lot of the. Uh, terrible consequence of the two hurricanes down at, down at Slide L. Uh, you know they're not testing any right now, but but even prior to this time, the testing was uh, was was very infrequent. Uh, you know that's that's uh, to uh, to save money to to 
you know, you don't, you don't get that much out of it. And that's the Achilles heel, uh, I view, uh, of, the, of the shuttle program. <coughs> if you're not going to, if you're not going to do it right, whether you can't afford to do it right, or, you know, you have other ambitions, you want to do something else in the space program or within NASA, you, you probably ought to stop it because it's going to, it's going to be the next failure if you don't, you know, if you don't, uh, if you don't treat it right. Uh, uh, today you've got uh, the, uh, the shuttle program back when the engine started. It's about, it's a little over three, almost three and a half decades old. That's, that's at a minimum. Two changes of, you know, two generational changes in a lot of small businesses that support the shuttle program. And, and, and so you're, you know, you're going to lose a lot of the, a lot of the, uh, of the, of the knowledge when you have the turnover of these generational changes. And, and, uh, uh, you know, little things, I'll tell you the other, you know, you look back and one of the, one of the major uh, disappointments to me and uh, area uh, or, or traumatic times in the program was, was uh, uh, back in the uh, uh, late 70s when we were building the first three engines that would uh, power Columbia on STS-1. When we were building those engines, we had a mix-up of well wire uh, in the Canoga plant. And the mix-up was the well wire was in, you know, one could take a heat treat and the other one couldn't take a heat treat. They had, I, I, I forget the application where you wanted the non-heat treatable well wire. But, you know, that was a mom and pop operation that came in, got the well wire, took it home and cleaned it, and then, and then, and then delivered it back in baskets to Rocketdyne. Well, they got it mixed up. And so we built the first three flight engines with well wire that would not take a heat treat that we depend on. So you go out and you look at those engines with, with, with inches and inches and rows and rows of wells that, that are not to the proper heat treat. So we had to go through and, uh, 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 and analyze every section and over test those engines at a little higher pressure than we normally would have to be able to show that 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 the that the uh, uh, having been built with a wrong well wire uh, it was still good enough because the design was up to up to FBL and a little beyond that it could still take it and operate at the rated uh, thrust condition so it's so it's mistakes like that 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 without frequent manufacturing exposure Without frequent test uh, use, uh, you're going to lose in the program, and and will become the next. Uh, uh, you know, the program has not been surprised uh, by a problem yet. Uh, I'm talking about all the shuttles, uh, the O-ring failures. Uh, they winked uh, uh, early on to Thiokol and then to Marshall. Uh, you know, before uh, Challenger. And the, uh, and, the, and the foam problem has been winking uh, all the time, and it's gotten worse later. Uh, uh, I suppose it has something to do with the change they made in the insulation uh, uh, later on. But, uh, 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 you know, as you know and you read, it's at a, you know, the agency's at a very critical time today. They've got a They've got to make some decisions in terms of where their priorities are and, and what they want to try to do. And, uh, uh, and they don't want to spend money on the shuttle uh, because they seem to be committed to, to replacing it. And, you know, if that's what you're going to do, that's what you've got to do. But over the next, you know, between now and 2010, if that's the year they choose to retire the shuttle, they're, they're not going to be motivated to test. And so that's going to, you know, the, the program is going to be in more risk over the next four years than it was in the first four years because of that reason. Uh, the, you, don't know, you don't know where the ledges are, where the, where the cliffs are.
and uh, and testing once a month or once every two months is is uh, uh, you know is just not going to do it. Mayor, you said something that I didn't even know that was really recognized. You said that there could have been a point in time in the program where you could have gone back and reduced the, the pressure levels and that type of thing, made the engine a little simpler to to certify. What would have been the amount of what? How would that? Uh, what effect would that have had? On well, an easy way to do it. You know, we looked at uh, probably several years before the first flight. Uh, 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 you know, we'd seen enough at that time to know that that, uh, that 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 even with the philosophy that we had adopted, we were on fairly shaky ground. To uh, uh, you know, I, I would never have guessed that the shuttle would have flown over a hundred times and never had a. Uh, a failure of the shuttle main engine or, or some problem. I'd have never guessed that, uh, um, having looked at what I looked at. But but uh, so we were starting to think, and an easy way to do it is open up the throat on a main combustion chamber. If you open up the throat, you relax the pressures up and down the turbine system, the pre-burners, the, the 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 pump requirements, and <coughs> you know you wouldn't have to open it up much. You'd lose a little specific impulse, you'd gain a little in thrust, and 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 so you'd get some offset there. Uh, may want to adjust the mixture ratio overall you operate at instead of 6.0, maybe 6.2. Uh, uh, so you could have done it with uh, uh, a modest performance hit. You're not going to get it for free, but you could have you could have relaxed the pressures throughout that whole system. By a change in one compound, uh, and 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 we were we were contemplating that, and 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 the monies never came. You know, it was a it was a configuration change. It would, you know, there would there were there's a lot of uh, of the, you know, you know what don't you know about that change is what would bother some people. Uh, uh, so I don't want to oversell it as simple, but it was conceptually it was a it was a simple change. So that would be the. That would be one. The uh, uh, I think I think looking back, uh, 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 you know, and knowing the capability uh, of the shuttle, and and uh, and and to be honest, uh, uh, being being somewhat troubled, quite a bit troubled, by what I hear and read about NASA wanting to retire, it, although I understand their reason. Uh, 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 some view it as a flawed, a flawed design. I don't, I don't view it as a flawed design. I think you need to, you need to relook at how you operate it. I, I don't, you know, I, I hadn't been particularly pleased with the operation of the shuttle. The, you know, the no, you know, watching all this foam fall off and not, not even raising your hand. Uh, uh, but then after all that occurred. They, they, nobody stopped and stripped all that foam off and maybe replaced it with cork that's heavier. It, it's got, you know, that's got some uh, 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 tensile strength that, that you, can, you, you can anchor it on there with glue or whatever you want to do, and, and it's going to cost you some performance. So NASA's been biased too much, and they certainly started this in the shuttle main engine. In the direction of performance, where if you back off a little bit, the system will be a lot better, a lot more robust, serve you a lot better uh, over the long haul, and uh, and and maybe you don't push too much in in some of these directions that have got us in trouble. You think that we had a uh, specific requirement for all the performance we were trying to achieve with the shuttle? Uh, I think you know I I don't. I don't think we needed all that. Tell me the missions that we needed all of that performance on. You don't, you know, it's not there. Uh, you could have, you, uh, you know, you'd have to, you'd have to reset the manifest in some cases. Uh, 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 well, well, speaking for the one element that I know the most about the. The shuttle engine, uh, you don't, 
you know, you'd, you know, if you f folks were to undertake a, a, a job to, to, okay, what would I do different? They're talking about using the shuttle engine uh, on this heavy lift launch vehicle for the for an upper stage cryogenic upper stage engine. Uh, I'd open that throat up. Uh, you know, look hard at that. You know, Rocket Nine knows how to do that. They've done it. They, you know, we just haven't incorporated. Uh, a relax those, although a men ain't gonna, you know, men aren't envisioned to be on that. You're still, uh, you're still gonna be a lot better off. I tell you, a problem that you're gonna have with, uh, uh, with the, uh, uh, with the vacuum start, or at upper stage start, is the, uh, is that start sequence. This start sequence is very, very sensitive, and and you're probably gonna have to go to Tullahoma to get in some kind of a vacuum system to demonstrate that, that's going to be expensive in itself. But, but yes, I, I would, uh, uh, Aaron, I think probably across the board we, uh, we, we, uh, we set the bar higher than we, higher than we really needed to. And it cost us in, uh, in uh, 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 money and, and, you know, it, it's also cost us in, in margin that we don't have that we that we wish we had. Uh, uh, Usually, um, this time we take about a two-minute break. So okay. Give your, give your voice a rest. Everybody, stand up, turn around, and just stretch a bit. Again. Um, I'll, I'll just say, give one, one statistic that, that I remember really impressed me when, uh, during, during our initial astronaut training when they were talking about the main engine, and you talked a lot about the high pressure turbo pump. Um, this is a device that's about the size of a typical automobile engine, right? That's right. It produces 50,000 horsepower just, just to pump the, the, the liquid oxygen at high pressure. I mean that that really gets your attention when you know when you talk about pushing the state of the art and trying to get a lot of power out of a, a small volume. That that just really amazed me. Uh, yeah, I, uh, uh, you know, as, as was indicated, I think I'd like to uh, to uh, uh, here just make a couple more remarks and then maybe open it up for some discussion and. In terms of points that I haven't co covered that are on your mind, or, or other questions that you'd like to ask, uh, just kind of in summary, if I look back on the program, I think there were there were uh, there were two main keys to uh, 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 that were paramount to the success that the shuttle engine uh, uh, enjoyed and is enjoying through its track record today. One was a decision to use the to use this ISTB to get away from the from the serial serial component test and then the systems test to try to combine it and and do a systems engineering job on a thing from day one. In other words, you know that was that was key to me. It it uh, uh, you know might have been a little extra pain, but saved a lot of time and a lot of money. And I'm not sure we could have done it the other way uh, uh, anyway. And the other one, which may be a little bit more important, but, but, but just as important, and that was uh, uh, the, the philosophy in the program of, 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 uh, of test of failure. Know where the failures are. And certainly, if you look at that earlier chart, we had plenty of data points. I mean, you, you, you know, we had, we'd encountered uh, a number of them, so, some of them three or four times. So, so, you know, maybe in some cases we were slow learners, but there were, there were a number of, uh, 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 you know, there, were, there wasn't just one problem with that high pressure LOX turbo pump. The, uh, <clears throat> I think I'd be remiss if I didn't, if I didn't acknowledge uh, <clears throat> uh, some of the people as viewed from the engine. That uh, that made major contributions to the sh to the shuttle, not just the engine now, but the shuttle. 
in the rock of dying, I've mentioned Dom Sankini a couple of times, Bob Biggs, uh, who's been there since day one and, and has done all of the all of the test planning and is a, and is a key. He is the systems engineer on uh, uh, on the SSME. Byron Wood, who is now the president at uh, at Rocketdyne. Joe Stanglin, uh, who was in charge of turbo machinery, who 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 designed this little paddle and solved this vortex problem that that uh, uh, uncoupled us from uh, from uh, 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 from this terrible time that we uh, uh, here we're at a standstill. Matt Eck, who was in charge of uh, turbo machinery uh, at Rocketdyne before he passed on several years ago. And then within NASA, uh, I mentioned John Yardley. Uh, he was, uh, who is now uh, passed on as well. He, he was, I don't think there would be a shuttle uh, without John's leadership. <clears throat> Uh, Bob Thompson, who uh, who uh, you might get an opportunity to hear a little bit later. I think he was a driving force in the shuttle. Uh, Bob Lindstrom, who was my boss for some time. Chris Kraft, uh, who I uh, understand you'll hear or have heard. Uh, uh, certainly Aaron. Uh, uh, we had to the interface with uh, the orbiter, and uh, 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 he had uh, an equal challenge. Uh, Arnie Aldridge, who I've always thought uh, a lot of, as well as Dick Coors. And then I'll mention uh, uh, Bill Lucas, who was the, uh, the director at Marshall, and George Hardy, uh, both of whom got caught up in a later controversy on uh, challenge. Uh, not necessarily fair, but uh, uh, that's life. I mean, uh, they were both superb engineers and, uh, uh, and meant a lot. And then also Gene Covert uh, uh, from MIT, who, who was the, uh, 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 how shall I say this, uh, uh, came in periodically and, and uh, chastised us uh, 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 appropriately and and uh, uh, I think made a major contribution to the program. Hey, you have to mention that uh, the students at the time, Gene was also head of the ROS department here at MIT and running back and forth. Yeah, John, John Yardley uh, uh, had asked, I'm not sure who triggered bringing Gene in, but I know John was, was uh, 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 a key driver in that. And so that's... Uh, I'm not sure I've touched on the kind of things you'd be interested in, but but uh, I'll certainly be glad now to to try to answer uh, 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 areas that perhaps I haven't hit, or or maybe make a few broader uh, uh, comments. Uh, uh, I understand the only element that uh, 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 other than the orbiter and maybe the overall system, but this is the only propulsion element that's. Uh, this talked about. I think the tank, I've, I've already mentioned there, the insulation was their tough nut, and I, I think, you know, having had some data, there are certainly some things that, that we could have done different. Uh, the solid rocket boosters are, are uh, 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 they've made a, you know, there's, there's quite a history there. Uh, you know, Thiokol has now been uh, acquired by uh, ATK, uh, <clears throat> in consolidation of the solid rocket motor industry. But uh, uh, they've also made major improvements in the way they manufacture uh, uh, that. Uh, you know, those solid rocket motors are also made with glue. A lot of, uh, you know, that's, that's put on by hand. Uh, uh, I remember in, in visiting up there uh, after the Challenger accident, uh, back when I was a director at Marshall, uh, uh, a number of changes were made to automate a lot of that. I think uh, probably the solid rocket boosters, uh, when when properly uh, used and and, uh, and appropriately uh, uh, tested with uh, with and backed up by the right analysis, uh, is uh, um, 
you know, it's, a, it's an excellent propulsion system. I wouldn't, uh, uh, ISP is down some, but, but they're, uh, 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 you know, more than adequate to do the job. complicated and didn't really seem, at least I don't think we really seem to have that much problem was integrating the engines and the engine of the armor. That was a complicated system, but it did go pretty well. Can you, can you, was it the main propulsion test article that did that? Or what, what, uh, well, uh, yes. The, uh, 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 it was earlier, you know, we went to school a lot on, on the integration of the J-2 into the S-4B stage uh, and the S-2. Where, where, where the conditioning of the engine prior to engine start was, was uh, important and, and was a big interface with the stage itself. And certainly that was true with, uh, with the boat tail of the orbiter uh, and the main propulsion test article, which uh, uh, Aaron mentioned was, a, was a, uh, I guess we had a, a dozen fly tests down there, somewhere between a half dozen and a dozen. Matter of fact, we had a, uh, uh, a failure, structural failure of a main fuel valve uh, crack at, uh, uh, down in Mississippi in that test article and uh, uh, caused uh, some consternation along the way. Uh, but the integration, as Aaron, Aaron mentioned, went, went quite well. I don't think in flight we've ever had uh, <coughs> any problems with uh, with overpressurizing that, uh, that that boat tail, or or any problems with it, uh, uh, there are a number of, of tests that that we didn't conduct, or a few that we didn't conduct on the engine that 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 I would have liked to. Uh, a for curiosity, and then B to to, uh, to fill a square so we knew exactly what it would. What would be, uh, you know, what would happen if we ever got in that condition? That was with uh, a LOX depletion. Uh, uh, there's some thought that that a LOX depletion is gonna is gonna allow you to imbalance the uh, of, of the rotor of the LOX pumps, and they're gonna rub, cause a fire, and all that. Um, uh, on the other hand, it's by definition uh, gonna be a fuel-rich uh, uh, shutdown. You know, I would I would tend to think, but but it was one test that we debated quite a bit about in the in the shuttle program, and and uh, uh, and, and and decided that uh, the probability of getting in that situation probably didn't merit the test. Uh, I will add that that there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of good tension within the shuttle program. Uh, uh, between you know up and down at all levels, uh, I thought the the whole management team was was relative cohesive, uh, uh, but there was good tension. I mean it was uh, 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 you know we got the best out of out of everybody and arrived at the best answer by by the balance that we had between the institutional managers. Uh, I mentioned the contribution I think that. Uh, that uh, Chris Kraft made and Bill Lucas. Uh, I'd also add uh, uh, early on Rocco Patron, uh, uh, and then the program managers, uh, the John Yardies and Bob Thompsons and and uh, Arnie Aldridge's, uh, and in the and in the so-called level three, uh, which Aaron and I were. Uh, I guess you were two. Uh, but but. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think it was a well-balanced ba uh, management uh, uh, structure, uh, and I'm not sure you have that today. Uh, today, for whatever reason, uh, the program has <clears throat> gotten in an operational mindset. Center directors are more viewed uh, to keep the grass cut at the centers and that kind of thing. Uh, so you don't have that tension. Who's going to hold the... You know who, who who's holding the the program people in check? Uh, I see that I see that missing. Uh, there, you know, I always felt that that, that 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 there was another institutional side that was that that had that had my hands cuffed at the right time. 
And so I think as, 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 as NASA goes forward and, and, and maybe some of you folks that are going to have careers in, in the industry, you ought to, <clears throat> you ought to, you ought to make sure that a, 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 you're surrounded by good people and that you're surrounded by a good, a good system. I mean, a good, a good system that, that pulls you up at the right time or calls you in check at the right time. Uh, uh, you know, whatever you do, you know, whether it's going back to the moon or Mars or uh, maybe in retrospect flying a shuttle a little bit more. Uh, so I, here, let me slow down and stop a minute now and, and see if there are any other areas that y'all would like to cover. Yes. Um, we've talked in the past a lot about the slow kind of turnaround on the shuttle, and part of that has been attributed to having to remove the engines and I'm not sure if it's overhauling them, but basically you know, taking them partly apart and looking at it and examining it. And I was wondering if that was part of the original plan or what kind of changed the, the um, efficiency of, of that turnaround time, you know, what, what caused it to change and, and slow down in the original plan? Well, the original plan, you know, was was for 55 missions uh, on an engine, but that uh, that was, uh, <clears throat> you know, that just didn't materialize at all once we saw what we had. Um, I, I I don't I don't know what today's life on a set of bearings are, but it's it's a handful of missions, so you've got to you've got to tear down the, the both of the high pressure pumps and replace the bearing. Same on turbine blades. You've got to, you want to replace that stack uh, after a few missions that are defined in the current certification program. I, you know, it's, it's probably, it's certainly less than a half a dozen. And, and yes, that has built in the time. But you could, you could overcome that by just dropping the whole engine and replacing it with another one and, and uh, uh, you know, and doing it all in parallel. Uh, there were, there were a lot of people on this program that I never envisioned you needed. Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, I think I think NASA did the right thing by turning it over to a contractor or a team of contractors, but they 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 you know they stayed too much involved. So it was all done by a committee. I mean, it was it was. Uh, 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 you know, you you know, I don't I don't want to pick on Columbia, but take who was in charge? Who 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 felt you know who felt they were really responsible for uh, that accident? I couldn't I couldn't see it, and I I followed the you know I I could offer my opinion, but that I don't, I didn't sense that the program had had. Uh, uh, you know, had somebody in charge. Yeah, there was another one. Yes. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk about any uh, examples that you know where specific technologies that came out of the shuttle main engines have either been used or avoided in newer launch vehicles today. No, I think a lot of the materials uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, will certainly be carried forward, coatings. Uh, seal technology. That's probably one of the areas in the shuttle, uh, in the turbo machinery, that I didn't talk about enough. It, it was the, the uh, 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 you know, the, la the, the, the number of seals on those shafts that are, that are very critical to the operation. And uh, there was a lot of technology advancement made in the, in the, in the development of the SSME on seals. Uh, so those would be several examples. Yes. I don't think there's much discussion before the project started on the risks of going from 700 psi operating pressure over steam, like with the current standard, to something like 3,000. Whether there was an option to go to an intermediate pressure. I, I, I'm sure there probably was. Again, again, I, I came in the program about a year. Uh, after it started, so I, I, I was on a periphery of some of the early stuff. Um, <clears throat> but I think the risk at that time <clears throat> more focused on, uh, on NASA, particularly at Marshall. I think they wanted a, a liquid booster. 
uh, uh, Eberhard Ries, the German, uh, uh, felt very comfortable with the liquid boosters because they, you know, you could shut them off uh, as opposed to the solids. Uh, but uh, cost and, and, and other things, I think they eventually became comfortable that the solids were uh, fine. So I think, I think, I think the risk trade-off was more on the booster. <clears throat> you know, you can shut a liquid off. When you like those solids, solids, you're going somewhere. Uh, uh, on the engine, I don't think. Uh, I knew they. I know they knew it was going to be harder. I'm. I'm not sure. They appreciated the 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 uh, uh, how hard it actually got to uh, end up with those 8,000 psi uh, pressures at the uh, head of the pre-burners, uh, and what that did to the rest of the system, and what it did to uh, to materials, and what it did to crack growth rate, and and everything from then on. <coughs> a lot of a lot of uh, factor. Yeah, you you uh, uh, you wouldn't fly today without it. I mean you. You, you understood the mechanism, you applied fracture mechanics, then you applied several factors, and then you certified that, and that's where you went. <clears throat> Does your crack industry do the same thing? Because they have turbine blades too that crack, don't they? I'm really not sure. I, 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 uh, I'm not, well, I don't want to fly on an airplane that's got a crack blade. <laughs> You talked about um, the lack of testing nowadays compared to at the beginning of the program. To what extent does the fact that, I mean, after every flight, they take the engines out and they bore scope and they look at that. I mean, does that, to some extent, constitute continual testing? No, I don't, I don't think. <coughs> you, what you get out of the well, test Well, I think they're stand. probably, uh, you know, the today's teams, they... You know, they go to the logbook and they read what was written down by the last generation, and that's what they inspect. That, that that's fine, and that's very thorough. But the testing, you, you know, the introduction of a of a of some kind of a small change by a mom and pop operation that I alluded to earlier, that, that's what a test program will catch. Uh, some some new problem that creeps in. Uh, 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 will get caught that's not done there. No, I don't think that, uh, I, I, th I think it's, you know, let me say it another way. I believe it is very dangerous to execute this program in the way that I understand is planned to be executed between now and when they retire the shuttle. I think that's the most dangerous period in the life of the shuttle because of that. I mean, uh, the the people that are in the program now have not been part of developing it. They don't, you know, they, uh, uh, I don't know how many pictures they've seen of, uh, of a LOX pump that's burned up. That, that, that uh, uh, you know, you just think about things different once you've been exposed to that firsthand. That's my view of it. <clears throat> now, how you, how you transition from what, how you transition out of a shuttle program onto something new? I, I don't have that answer. I mean, I think you gotta, I think you gotta do both. I, you know, like the wing walker, I, I wouldn't let loose of, of a shuttle before I had something else in hand. And and today they're gonna let loose of this and then hope this other thing comes along. And I think there's some risk to that. <clears throat> Along the, that line with the, the O-ring issue and the foam issue, do you think that those were never solved or never looked at because of lack of money or just confidence in the technology at the time? I mean, the O-ring was kind of carried over a little bit. The foam, I don't know how much that was brand new. And nowadays, are we just relying on the confidence these things have worked for 100 missions or so? Or is it just lack of money? No, I think, uh, I, I can't say there was a lack of money back at the time of the O-ring. Had they wanted to, had the, had the culture been to, uh, had the culture been and, and, and 
And if they were inquisitive enough to pursue it, I think they could have gotten the money to do it. it on, the, on the shuttle engine, out of necessity, the culture was, was there. I mean, it was driven by people like Yardley. Uh, it, it was, uh, uh, you know, I think another thing at NASA and aerospace and, you know, you can do wonderful things with computers today, but too much, you know, too little of all this analysis is anchored by a good failure. You know, you don't, you know, you got the analysis, uh, uh, you, you know, you got a lot of programs, you can, you know, you can do a heck of a job on analysis today, but it's not necessarily anchored in, in, uh, in the remnants of a good failure, one that, one that has uh, uh, adequate data. So if I'm building a test bed now, how do I kind of intelligently justify to my sponsors that I want to have a budget for like, uh, lots of failures? Well, you, uh, I, I don't think you're going to sell it that way. Right. <laughs> but, but, uh, well, let me, you know, uh, you know, I think it's got to, you know, I, I think your sponsor, or whoever, has got to have a good appreciation of how, how far you're going to be pushing the technology. Uh, if it's oversold, uh, you know, if you oversell it, then you're not going to get the money to be able to, to stand those. Uh, uh, if, you, if you push too hard in that direction, your sponsor is probably going to get disinterested. Uh, so that's going to be a fine line, but, but uh, 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 you know, pick a, pick a current uh, example. Uh, pick what, what, what I, in, at least as I understand it, NASA is trying to do with... Uh, <clears throat> with the uh, uh, you know with the lunar project or the moon project, uh, uh, I for one, I for one think that uh, that their yardstick is going to be tough. Uh, they're they're going to you know Apollo didn't have any failures. Why why are you going to have any failures? Uh, so I think. Uh, 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 I think they're going to have to be very careful how they sell that program. Uh, just because they're using or will use shuttle-derived elements, an external tank, a, uh, uh, maybe a five or, or an additional segment to the, to the solid motor, the SSME, uh, that's not going to be a freebie. I mean, I mean... Uh, uh, I've already told you, I, I would do some things to the shuttle main engine uh, uh, in, in building an, an, a different program. The tank, I, I, would, I, I, would, I would go to a, uh, uh, you know, they're not going to keep the foam from coming off on the configuration that they have. And I also wouldn't, wouldn't assume that, well, I don't have a problem now because I don't have an orbiter on the side of it. You know, the foam ain't supposed to come off. So I'd, I'd, I'd degrade uh, the insulation and put on something that would, that, that would stay, uh, as an example. Yes? How much of the original engine, like the current engine right now, is it exactly the same as the original one, or what has changed? Materials, is the computer the same? Is everything exactly the same? I think uh, I think it is the it, it is the same. I'm sure there are through engineering change proposals or or uh, fairly low level change traffic some some things have been uh, upgraded. But but it's uh, you know Inconel is still the the basic material of the housing. Um, uh, the uh, turbine blades are still Mar M246, uh, 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 you know, which is a high-strength copper, I think. Um, so that's the same thing. They they still use uh, ball bearings when they fly, and I don't know the 
change point on this, but Pratt Whitney makes the, the high pressure turbo pumps now. They they used uh, roller bearings, and uh, uh, you know that's a that would be a big change. Uh, the two high pressure pumps uh, that have now been incorporated in the shuttle engine, but uh, other areas the. The turbo pump, the high pressure turbo pump. Yeah, I, 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 at some point a couple years ago, I think they were, they were incorporated and brought in. So those would be big part number changes. <clears throat> but a lot of other areas of the engine, I think it's the same, and, and I think it's you know that's, that's one of the reasons that they feel they don't need to, test much. They, they've got all that, and. Uh, so we'll have to see how the next four or five years play out. Anything else? What about, you know, if, since they're talking about using a lot of these with the next generation vehicle and they, and they won't be reusable, so what, what can be done? I mean, what's the way to go about kind of derating the shuttle? Not, you talked about opening the throat, but all the other things that make the engine reusable and presumably make it more expensive. Can, will it really be the same engine when, when they get finished? I mean, what, 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 ha what has to be done? What I don't know. I mean, I mean some may, uh, <coughs> may argue and suppose that uh, 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 because the requirement for a reusable engine isn't there, we'll, uh, you know, eliminate some of the things. I don't know what they'd be, but, but I would, you know, having... Having paid all that development, I, I'm not, sh uh, you know, I, I, I would be more inclined to really, to really minimize the ch change for change's sake and, and, and do some things like open up the throat. I mentioned that as an example that would, do, that would reduce the operating pressures and I think give them, uh, you know, give them more margin across the board. Um, you know, on a tank, I'd, I'd, I'd go to a, an insulation system that that's going to uh, be a little less efficient. You're going to have more boil off, weigh a lot more, but uh, 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 something that uh, you know doesn't give you other problems. Sure, I'm going to ask a question that's asked of me that I couldn't answer it uh, early. Uh, did we ever look at putting the insulation internal to the external tank rather than outside? I'm not aware that it was looked at or, uh, you know, somebody uh, along the way, I, I suspect, could have, could have, uh, no, I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not aware of, uh, of what it was, of what it would have been. Anything else? Well, I've enjoyed it. I hope you, uh, uh, as you, uh, you know, here don't repeat the same mistakes that that we made this time around. <clears throat> and good luck in your projects. Thank you. Very much. <clears throat> I'm going to just take the last three minutes. Um, Jarrah referred to the fact that that we only had one engine shut down in the whole history of the, uh, of the program, um, and that was due to a sensor. Um, just to give you a sense of what goes into the operation of this system, um, it, it was always recognized that, uh, you know, you have sensors looking at the temperatures and, and, and the idea is that if anything starts to go wrong with the engine, you want to shut it down now before the thing blows up because we can, we can lose one engine and, and have an intact abort, but if the engine blows up and takes the whole boat tail with it, you're not going to get back. So generally, you fly with, uh, there's a little switch in the cockpit which enables the ability of the sensors to shut down the engines, and you fly with that on. But the problem is if you lose one engine uh, and you get into an abort mode, now, at least for the first part of, of that abort mode, if, if you lose a second engine, now with only one engine remaining, you can't 
you can't complete an intact abort. So what the crew does, if you lose an engine, you, you take that switch and you, put, and you disable the automatic shutdown. Well, what happened was the, they were uh, a few minutes into the launch. Um, the uh, the, um, the sensor uh, started to, uh, to go off scale. Uh, the engine was shut down, but they were far enough into the launch that they can actually do an abort to orbit. They took the engine switch to disable normal procedure. Uh, when they got a little further along so that they were in what they would, would be able, uh, you know, a, a little further on, I forget the exact details, but they were, they, they took the switch back to enable. Um, but what one of the, what the, the main engine flight controller on the ground noticed that the sensor in one of the other engines was also starting to go off scale. And if that was allowed, they would, uh, it would basically uh, take down a second engine. That would have put them in a single engine, what we would have called an intact transatlantic abort. But by that time, they were too far to, uh, to land in the normal abort site. And they would have ended up landing somewhere in Africa, I think, in the dark. I mean, it, it would have been a really bad situation. Um, and so the flight controller was, was sharp enough uh, to, to tell the flight director, uh, you know, we've got another bad sensor, tell the crew to uh, take the switch to inhibit. Um, luckily, the, the flight director had had some, his background was in uh, the propulsion system. He knew exactly what the, the flight controller was talking about. They called it up to the crew, they took it, and, and so this, the second engine did not shut down. And in fact, they, they made it into orbit and they managed to complete the mission. But you know, these are decisions which have to be made in split seconds. In fact, the flight controller who, who made that call was given a, a special award and, uh, from, from NASA. And uh, you really have to know these systems inside out. And, and that's, of course, why, why we have so many simulations where they, they run those sorts of failure cases so that people are able to make these decisions uh, very quickly in real time, and that basically um, saved the shuttle and the crew from a potentially a really, really bad situation. Yeah. Is, 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 is the burn done by the main engine? No, no, no. no they're done by the ohms. Now, once once the uh, once the main engines shut down, um, they are uh, you know you you've dropped the tank, so you don't have any more propellant. Um, and we have had, uh, there have been a few, uh, I think four engine shutdowns on the pad. You, you start the engines about six seconds before T0. That gives them enough time to come up to full operating performance so that you can check out that they're okay. It also gives the, remember we talked about the twang because of the asymmetric thrust, the, gives you enough time for the orbiter to, to tilt forward and then come back. And then when you're vertical, that's when you fire the, the engine. I've, I've got some pictures of this. At, at, at one class, I'll, I'll show you some slow motion pictures of the launch. You can see all that. We've had four pad shutdowns. Of those, two were due to real problems with the engine, and two were due to instrumentation problems. So you know, it's always a problem of how much, do you, how much instrumentation do you put in, how much do you trust it. And I know Aaron's made the point on several occasions of if you put an abort system in for the crew, you know, is that going to be triggered automatically, um, or does it have to be manual? You certainly don't want to get shot off the end of a good working rocket just because your sensors have have told you that something wrong is happening. So there's there's a lot of interesting uh, engineering decisions to be made uh, with that. Okay, end of class. We'll see you on Thursday, and thanks again to JR.